Hey, we're glad to see you on our another shocking story. Enjoy watching. Amelia came home from work after a busy day and finally exhaled. Her boss was as angry as ever today, scolding her, threatening to put her on the street soon if she didn't learn how to sell their products. She took a cup of coffee from the vending machine and wandered toward the subway, trying to get away from the negativity. Thoughts wandered in her head unhappy. I've only been working for six months, and I've already received a scolding. How can I increase these sales when the country is in crisis and no one wants to take the damn vacuum cleaner? And I don't want to go home. No one is waiting for me there. No one needs me in this life. The girl went down to the crosswalk and the same beggar woman caught her eye again. It was a woman in her forties who looked like a gypsy, black hair, dark eyes, dressed in an incomprehensible long hoodie and a shabby jacket. She was holding a child in her arms, a boy about three or four years old in a dirty overalls, and he was sleeping all the time. The woman rocked him and begged alms in a pitiful voice. Give a hand. Good people. There's nothing to feed the baby. He's hungry. Every time Amelia threw some change into the tin, she paused for a few seconds, trying to get a better look at the baby. She wasn't sure if it was a doll or a real live baby. And if so, why did he sleep all the time? He was not breast, right? Maybe they gave him something to drink. Today the boy's hat was pulled up, and Amelia was able to see the brown curly hair and an interesting mole on his neck, shaped like a shell. But the gypsy woman immediately looked at her angrily and began muttering something in her language and covering the baby's face with her hands. Amelia even felt uncomfortable, and she tried to leave quickly. But even at home up to the night, the poor sleeping boy did not leave her mind. Who was he? Where had the dark-haired gypsy come from? She looked nothing like his mother. Poor boy, he, just as she had been, had found himself at the mercy of strangers, wanted by no one at all. Amelia went to the mirror and began to consider herself. If you turn sideways, very pretty face, fresh skin, long eyelashes and dimples on the cheeks, just admiring. But as soon as I turned the other way, there was a freak. Yeah, yeah, the freak with the burn scar across his cheek. It made her face look a little twisted and gave a slightly frightening impression. No matter how much she tried to cover it up with makeup, it was all in vain. The skin was damaged too deeply. The girl recoiled from the mirror and threw it to the floor in her heart. It shattered into a hundred pieces and she wept bitterly, going over the fragments of her life and the unfortunate accident that divided her life into before and after. Amelia's mother had died while giving birth, so she only saw her in family photos. She was raised by her father alone. The man's name was Thomas, and he was a hard worker and a foreman in the aviation industry. Amelia loved her father madly. She remembered all her life his big, hard, warm hands that lifted her so high that it was scary, held her close to him, and did not let her go for a long, long time. The girl saw how difficult it was for her father, how he was exhausted and torn between caring for her and work, and tried not to be a miser and obey him in everything. She was always the last one in kindergarten, but she never cried, just waited patiently. And when at last her favorite daddy came into the playroom, she jumped on his neck with a squeal of happiness and how much pride and happiness she had when her daddy took her to first grade by the hand. He tied huge white bows for her himself and said, well, Emiliana, it's your first time in first grade. I cannot even believe that you're such a grown up, my sweetheart. Learn good and do not be afraid of no one. If someone hurts, I'll twist his head right away. And Amelia tried with all her might. Teaching was surprisingly easy for her. She proudly brought her father A's in the diary. And he kissed her on the cheeks, stroked her on the head, and praised her. And on summer vacation, she and Daddy went to the sea. It was such an event, it seemed like dreams were coming true. Thomas was rewarded at work with a trip for ten whole days. At the store we bought flippers and a mask, a swimsuit for our daughter, sunscreen, panamas, and caps. But the dream was never going to come true. 
Their tour bus had an accident one night. The gasoline spilled out of the tank burst into flames. The door jammed from the force of the impact and the passengers were trapped inside, like in a terrible trap. The father did not get confused, first broke the glass near his seat and jumped out of the bus and carried his daughter away from the unfortunate place and then went back to help the other passengers get out. The girl was crying and screaming. Daddy, don't go there, please, I'm scared. But the man only encouraged her. Now, now my daughter, be patient. Daddy quickly, there and back. I can't leave people there, do you understand? Isn't it human? There are so many children there, like you. They want to live too, and they're scared too. Don't cry. He had more than 15 lives saved, including those of little children. But he had no time to save himself, because the burning bus exploded. The blast wave hit Amelia too, and the dross hit her face, leaving her with an ugly scar across her cheek for life. But worst of all, she was orphaned forever. Her father had been posthumously awarded the Order of Courage, but what good is it if he is not there, and never will be? Amelia cried and screamed, and had almost no memory of her father's funeral. She was treated in the neurological ward and sent to an orphanage. There she became withdrawn at first and even began to stutter. The children laughed at her, teased her about being ugly, and made scary faces at her. Amelia was always malnourished. It seemed to her that there was no scarier place on earth than that. She was used to the warmth of home and her father's love and affection, and she felt very sick and sad here. No one knows how all this would have ended if she had not been pitied by an elderly teacher, Maria Zakharovna. She felt unspeakably sorry for this battered little girl with such intelligent and inquisitive eyes, who by all accounts was well-groomed and homely. It was she who found a way to approach her and took her under her wing. A woman who taught music in a shelter, and seeing Amelia's emotional state, she decided to sign her up for swimming because she knew that it relaxes her and positively influences her child's mind. And so it did. The water had a miraculous effect on her, and Amelia became calmer and more confident. She began to make progress. She swam faster than anyone else, learned the breaststroke and crawl stroke, took part in competitions on a local scale. Her stuttering passed by itself. She and Maria Zakharovna talked a lot. The girl shared her sorrows and troubles her successes and achievements. The woman even wanted to adopt her, as strongly fond of the soul, but she was denied it. Her age was advanced, and the salary is small, no husband, rented housing. But nevertheless, with her light hand, Amelia went from an ugly, battered duckling to a beautiful swan. She had long, gorgeous brown hair, a supple, athletic body, and a pretty face. But that awful scar spoiled everything crossed it all out. Maria Zakharovna, as much as she could, taught her to live with it and repeated as a mantra, you're a beautiful girl, love yourself. Don't pay attention to your flaw. You have many other virtues. You are sure to meet a good guy and he will love you. You deserve it, my girl. Unfortunately, Amelia was not able to make a career as an athlete, although she had all the prerequisites. Despite numerous awards and diplomas, she was not included in the national team. She was an orphan, she had no protection, and she had a frightening scar. Neither on TV nor in the newspaper could she be photographed. The girl was terribly upset, but her mentor supported her even here. After she left the orphanage, she helped her get a job as a manager at a small private firm through her acquaintances and got her a nice room in the dormitory. She convinced Amelia to study by correspondence, to become an economist. She kept telling her that she should not wear her diploma behind her shoulders. It would come in handy in life. But, unfortunately, three months ago Maria Zakharovna passed away. Her heart gave out. Amelia was very sad and grieved for her. There was no one to share good and bad things with. No one understood her like she did. The girl did not have friends either whether it was because of the scar or the fact that she was an orphan. Her co-workers treated her with a distinct coldness at work. On the personal front, 
things were complicated. While she was still an athlete, she met a boy, Valera. He also came from a poor family. His grandmother raised him alone. Outwardly, the guy was attractive. Tall, athletic, with a stiff hedgehog and a strong-willed chin. Feelings arose between the young men, or rather, Amelia thought so sincerely. They met in the evenings, walked in the park, kissed. She often asked the guy how he felt about her disability. For her, it was very important to know, but he only laughed and joked. My darling, but you have a great figure. Do not worry about nothing. Soon he began to come to Amelia's house, and then he even stayed overnight. So their first intimacy happened. Valera was gentle and affectionate, frantically whispering words of love, and swore fidelity to his bride. Amelia just sank in his arms and dissolved into an ocean of passion without a trace. The girl was happy. She rushed after work. She tried. She pampered her beloved with delicious dishes. She pleased him in everything. When she received her salary, she bought not herself, but her fiancé one thing and then another, starting with trendy headphones and ending with clothes. She made do with very little. A minimum of makeup and a couple of office dresses and suits with one pair of shoes. That's the whole closet. She hoped he would appreciate her care and warmth. She dreamed that soon she and Valera would marry and live as a friendly family. The guy worked as a courier, earned a penny, and most of all dreamed of getting out of poverty, of becoming rich, was just obsessed with it. But he had no intention of working too hard or of slaving away for 12 hours at a time. He wanted wealth to come to him in some incomprehensible way. Amelia, however, did not share his views. She believed that the main thing was love and trust, and that without money one could endure. Not everything in their relationship was smooth. They rarely went out together. Valera somehow became cold to her bride, became rude to her, and sometimes made cruel jokes. Literally, everything had become wrong for him. This really hurt Amelia, and they fought more and more often. She did not understand what was going on but somehow in a woman's intuition she knew that her beloved had someone. His behavior and attitude toward her had changed drastically. She was no longer Goldie and Sunshine, but suddenly became Chicken and Knave Fool. Then one day Amelia came home and found a horrible picture. Her fiancé was packing his things and running around the room. The girl was taken aback and did not understand. Valera, what are you doing? Why are you packing? What happened in general? He angrily blurted out in her face. So we are breaking up. That's what happened. I met Reza, and I'm leaving you. Even if she's 10 years older, it doesn't matter to me. But she's very rich. She has her own business. And what a car she has. Her own mansion in a residential district. And most importantly, she's crazy about me. Finally, I'll get out of this misery, Dan. Tears spontaneously involuntarily gushed from Amelia's eyes. And me. What about me? And our love? I had hoped that we were about to be married. And you? Without love, will you be happy with this Reza? Does money mean everything to you? The bridegroom only muttered, What do I need you for? An orphan and childless ugly cannot get pregnant. What will I see in my life with you? We'll live on potatoes from paycheck to paycheck. I don't want that kind of life. So I'm sorry. Amelia fell into a chair, covered her face with her hands, and burst into tears. She did not utter a word more, and just watched as her Valera sneakily escapes. An open wound was left in her heart. Since that day, the girl generally began to shun men. She realized that she could not expect anything good from them. Every day, she came to an empty room where no one was waiting for her, warmed her supper, and cried without sleep, so lonely despite the fact that it seems that she was 25, and all is not so bad, but not much good either. And now all her thoughts were on that little boy from the subway crossing. Amelia had agonized all night thinking about him, and decided that today she would definitely go and ask the gypsy woman what her son's name was, and why he was sleeping. There had to be some explanation, didn't there? So she did. After work, she bought a bun, 
some sweets and some juice, and from a distance she saw the familiar Romani woman. She was still begging, holding the boy in her arms, and he was still asleep. That was more than alarming. There was something wrong with the child. The girl walked right up to the woman, handed her a juice and a muffin, and said, This is for your son. What is his name? Why does he sleep all the time? Can I give it to him myself? He must be hungry, right? The beggar pretended not to hear, lowered her eyes, and wrapped herself in the collar of her worn jacket. The girl repeated the question, Why does he sleep all the time? Is the boy sick? Maybe we should take him to a doctor. The woman looked up again. Her eyes were full of tired irritation mixed with impassivity and indifference. It was not the look of a mother. She whispered through her lips, Go where you were going. The girl just shook. She was out of control and almost shouted. Why is he sleeping, I ask you? Amelia tried to take the baby by the hand and to turn him to her face. But the gypsy suddenly jumped up sharply from the carton and shouted in her own language, rudely pushing our heroine away. Some kindly passerby, an elderly man, threw some money into the glass and reproachfully began to reprimand Amelia. Well, why are you shouting? Wake up the baby, he's probably exhausted enough, and fell asleep. You see, she's not sitting here for the good life. Here, daughter, take some. The beggar immediately crossed herself, showing a universal humility and sorrow on her face. You were told to go your own way, or do you need a better explanation? And a small knife flashed in his hand. Amelia, frightened, merely nodded and ran away, glad to have escaped with her feet and understood the most important thing. The boy really was being slipped something, and he was clearly not the woman's son, so it was a whole scheme a criminal business. The girl was not going to retreat. She decided to save the child from the clutches of these mercenary crooks who did not care about the child, as long as passersby threw money at him. Amelia pulled herself together and went not to her house, but to the police station. Emotional, she staggered to explain to the officer on duty at the window what had happened. You understand, this child in the arms of a beggar, he's always asleep. Why? He is not a baby. He looks about three years old. Such a big baby can't sleep all day long. So they're giving him something to drink. I'm ready to write a complaint. We must save the baby. He's obviously in danger. I beg you, check her documents. But to her indignation, neither the officer on duty nor the policemen who were nearby and were talking about something when they heard what it was about were not even going to take any statements from her. Moreover, they made a mockery of her. Listen, citizen, whatever your name is, Amelia, go home and do not play with our heads here. What gypsy, what child? How do I know if it's her son or not? And why is he sleeping? And how long do children even sleep? I don't have any. Do I have to chase after every beggar? There's nothing else for us to do. We're up to our eyeballs in this mess. Do you want more than anyone else? Or don't you have anything better to do? All these people come around, taking up our time. If it were true, if something had happened, or if someone had been beaten up or robbed, Amelia just waved her hand. It's clear nobody cares about the common people. It's the same as always. In the evening, scrolling through social networks, she suddenly came across the page of a volunteer who was searching for people by himself. He was posting photos and pleas of parents who were unsuccessfully searching for their loved ones, including their children. Amelia gathered her courage and wrote him everything as it was. She had not expected an answer to come so quickly, but to her surprise, Maxim, that was the man's name, responded instantly, listened again, and offered to join her. Looking through such ads, hoping to find a similar one, to look for a boy of three. He, for his part, also promised to help, so they began to do it. Posted everywhere Amelia's post that in the passage of a gypsy begging with a sleeping baby boy, but he was clearly not hers, and the request to respond to those who are looking for a similar age child in their area. It's been a week. 
In the evenings, Amelia's eyes were watering from the thousands of help posts she'd seen, and it seemed she would never find what she needed in that whirlwind. Then suddenly, over the weekend, a man wrote to her. He was just begging for his phone number to call her. And soon he called. Girl, honey, I came across your post. My name is Earl. I'm a businessman. My son went missing six months ago, just three years old. He was stolen from under my ex-wife's nose. And that's it. He's gone. Believe me, I had all sorts of connections. Would you mind sending me a picture of that kid you saw? Maybe I'll recognize him as my son. At least a ghost, but a chance. Amelia grinned. How am I supposed to get a picture? I only tried to get closer and take the boy's hand, and I was nearly beaten by the bouncers who were hanging around. All I remembered was that he had curly blonde hair and a prominent mole on the back of his neck, closer to the back of his head, in the shape of a seashell. The man's voice almost cracked. My God, it's Carl. It's my son. It's him, all right. My son has that exact mole. I'll be there in an hour. I'm on my way. I need your address. You'll show me where you saw the gypsy girl. Indeed, in less than an hour there was a persistent knock at the door of Amelia's room. She opened the door and saw a pleasant man in his thirties in an expensive cashmere coat and crocodile leather boots. He nervously rubbed his briefcase in his hands and immediately got to the point. Good evening. Are you Amelia? And I'm that Earl we called the other day. I'm begging you. Let's not talk too much. Let's go. I already called the police and backup. They'll be here soon. We have no time to lose. Amelia wondered, are you the determined? And if it turns out that he is not your son, what then? Then I will just rescue someone else's child from the clutches of criminals. But you rescued him, didn't you? And he's nobody to you. You just took pity on the child, didn't you? And they got into an expensive man's jeep and rushed to the very crossing. Amelia went down there alone first. There it was, the gypsy with the boy in the same place. Then the girl went back down and nodded to the man. He gave the signal to the police and they rushed briskly downstairs and surrounded the woman on all sides. The bouncers Amelia had described were also rounded up though they were in a hurry to get out of the way, seeing that a tight mess was brewing. Earl snatched the baby out of the gypsy's hands and immediately cried out, holding him tightly to him. Sonny, Carl, found him. Bastard, tell me, what you drugged him? Why is he asleep? I'll put you all in jail for a long time. Amelia was not confused and shouted at him. Earl, hurry up and go to the hospital. We need to understand what is wrong with your son and how serious his condition is. You can see he is not opening his eyes or reacting to anything. The man put her son in Amelia's arms and they ran like the wind to the children's hospital. On the way the girl stroked the baby on his skinny, literally transparent cheeks, listening to his faint breathing and whispered, Have patience, my dear, just a little while left. The doctors will help you and you're sure to get better. You'll meet your daddy, and everything will be all right. Earl only whispered softly, Amelia, honey, thank you. I'm forever in your debt. You can't imagine what I went through when my son went missing. I didn't want to live. I wish he'd live. That's all I'm praying for. I wish my son would get well. Why doesn't he react to anything? At the hospital, they took my son, and immediately sent him to the intensive care unit. His condition was critical. The doctors called a board meeting and had a long discussion. Earl was pacing the hospital corridor like a tiger in a cage. He was clutching his head and greedily drinking water from the cooler, whispering to himself. Amelia sat quietly on the couch and prayed that the baby would get better. He felt pity for both father and son alike. They had both suffered. At last the gray-haired old doctor with glasses came out to them. He looked serious and anxious. Earl immediately ran up to him and asked in a broken voice, How is Carl? Is he going to live? What were those monsters doing to him? 
Why is he asleep and unresponsive to anything? The doctor took off his cap, sat down next to him on the couch. You see, the situation is very serious. Your son has been treated with strong sleeping pills and not fed at all for a long time. That is why his body was exhausted and was on the verge of death. You could say you saved him at the last minute. Now he is on intensive therapy, he is severely underweight and malnourished. We give him medications to purify the blood and vitamins. We hope that little by little he will make it. But I want to tell you right away, it is not a quick process. There's no telling what all this has done to his brain and other organs. Earl clenched his fists, he was literally shaking. What cattle? Nothing sacred. Stealing a baby, killing it slowly, and making money off of it. It's unbelievable. And all this is happening under the noses of the police. And nobody cares. I'll buy the best medicine I can. You name it. I'll do anything to make my son get better. The doctor replied, You are lucky. Usually they keep such children on alcohol, or on something worse, and they can die at any moment. We've dealt with that before. So sleeping pills are a gentle option. And the fact that this is a black business has been written about for a long time. Sincere people throw money away, hoping that it will go to the beggars or their unfortunate children, but it didn't turn out that way. The lion's share of the money is taken away, leaving only pennies for a bun and tea. Not only that, but the police often cover up the case, pretending they don't know anything about it. I'll write you a list of medications, but you can't see Carl yet. He's in intensive care. Come back tomorrow. Impressed by the doctor's story, Earl dropped to his knees right in the middle of the hall and wrapped his arms around Amelia's legs, muttering, Thank you, you are a guardian angel. If it were not for your responsive heart, it is likely that soon Sasha would be gone. How terrible it is. Just thinking about it makes me sick inside. Ask me anything, I will fulfill your every wish. The girl felt uncomfortable. She began to lift the man and whisper, Come on, Earl, get up. I don't want anything. I only did it because I felt sorry for the baby, not for greed. Let's go to a cafe nearby, and we'll talk about everything calmly. The whole staff is already staring at us. They sat down at a table in the cafe, ordered coffee, and Amelia asked, Earl, tell me, how did it happen in the first place that your son was stolen? That seems to me something unbelievable nowadays. The man sighed and began to tell the story. I married badly when I was young, and all my troubles came from that. Inga was very windy and reckless. While we were dating I was head over heels in love, and I even liked that about her. She dressed brightly, looked amazing, experimented boldly in everything. But when I got married, I realized she was a lousy spouse. She pissed off all the household chores. Inga preferred, as before, to run to clubs and lead a wild lifestyle. I gave almost all my time to work, got very tired. I wanted, on the contrary, home warmth, understanding, and comfort. But every night I found only a mountain of unwashed dishes and a whining Inga. I told her a hundred times to do something, to find something to do that would keep her busy. When she became pregnant, I was over the moon. I thought, well, now my wife will settle down, wake up in her maternal feelings, and our family will finally get peace and quiet. But it was not. After giving birth to Carl, Inga immediately went back to her old ways. Boutiques, salons, glamorous parties. She purposely did not breastfeed, even though she had plenty of milk, so as not to spoil her form. She had to buy formula. It's unbelievable. She didn't take care of the baby at all. I had to hire a nanny. She was more help than my mother. My wife was psychotic and hysterical at night and didn't want to get up to the baby. It was always me who did it. Carl reached out to me, feeling that I loved him very much. I tried to devote all my time to my son. Too bad I didn't have much of him. I couldn't understand how a mother could not love her child and treat him so neglectfully. We fought more and more often, scandals were constant in our family. And then on that fateful day, the nanny, 
as if on bad luck, got sick, and asked for time off. Inga was forced to go for a walk with her son by herself. The child was playing on the playground, and this hen was just chatting with her endless friends on the phone, and did not care about the child. She didn't even realize right away that strangers were taking him away, luring him away with a kitten. She did not even remember the signs of the kidnappers. She called me and got hysterical and started screaming that Carl had been stolen, and that's how I lost my son. I called the police, private detectives, searched all the yards, back alleys, morgues and hospitals. But Carl was gone. No leads, no trace. After what happened I literally hated Inga, she became disgusting to me. And we got divorced. I went to work, but every day and night I prayed to God that a miracle would happen and my son would be found. Although the police wouldn't give me a chance, they said too much time had passed and for sure the boy was dead. But I stubbornly didn't want to believe it. I waited and hoped. A miracle finally happened. And the magician was you, Amelia. Thank you again. I'll say it a million times. Now it's your turn. Tell me about yourself. I notice you live alone. Why? Still haven't met your love. You're such a young and pretty girl. Amelia became sad and told me about her life. There's not much to tell. My father died in front of my eyes when I was only seven years old. My father died in front of me when I was only seven years old. We were going to the sea together then. We had a terrible traffic accident, and I have had this ugly scar on my face ever since. Then there was an orphanage. I don't want to talk about it at all. It was the worst place in the world. I went swimming. I won prizes. I got plenty of literary awards. But what was the use? Who was going to let an orphan with a scar into the national team? They turned me down. I work as a manager in a small firm. I almost got married, but it didn't work out here either. My fiancé left me, found an older rich woman, said he didn't want a poor orphan and with a defect. That's how I live, all alone in this world. Things aren't going well in my life. I don't know why. I hate my face, everyone staring and when I ask them something, they look away. I don't care if I'm in the ground. Earl, can I come see Carl at the hospital tomorrow too? Check on him. I'm so worried about him. You have no idea. The man suddenly took the girl's hand and said, let's start with you, okay? What are we shouting at each other? Amelia, I do not mind at all. I'm even very happy if you visit Carl. In fact, let's talk to each other. Let's be friends, right? We're not strangers now, are we? Listen to what I have to say. Believe me, I've met a lot of glamorous beauties in my life, without a single flaw, but they can't compare to you. You have a kind of natural, inner beauty that beckons and attracts. I don't flatter you, I mean that sincerely. Let me give you a ride home, and we'll meet tomorrow for sure. Okay. Amelia blushed. She was very pleased by such warm and sincere words of Earl, and she liked the man himself. When he took her hand, it was like a fire inside her. She wanted him to hold her, not let go. All the next day, Amelia could not focus on work. All her thoughts were of Earl and Carl. Immediately after work, she rushed home and cooked a hot, fresh meal and drove to the hospital to see the boy. Carl got better and was moved to a private room. Earl was already there. The boy looked very pale and gaunt. He was looking around frightened, as if he didn't quite know where he was, and he was holding his father's hand tightly, smiling weakly at him. The man said something tenderly to him, stroked his curly hair, and was shining with happiness. Amelia quietly entered the room. The boy looked at her surprised and blinked his open blue eyes. She winked at him and said, Hello, Carl. How are you, honey? Come to your senses a little. Look what I brought you. A real robot transformer, as in the cartoon. Here you go. The boy immediately smiled, eagerly took the toy, and quietly babbled. Thank you. You're good. What's your name? Earl answered for her. Sonny. That's the same Aunt Amelia. She saved you from those mean uncles. And she made sure we met you. Then he turned to the girl. 
Amelia, I bought Carl some new pajamas, but he's so grimy. It's like he hasn't been bathed in six months. It's a nightmare. Can you help me with this? The doctor won't let us go home. He says we have to do more IVs and monitor his condition. Get a robe and a towel in the bag, and I'll take Carl. And he turned to his son. What's up, fighter? Let's go wash up. You look like a chimney sweep to me. The man picked up his son in his arms, and the three of them went into the shower room. After the bath, the boy looked completely unrecognizable. At last his cheeks had turned a little pink. He looked so handsome, just like an angel. Amelia began to take food out of the bag. She chirped. So, and now, after the bath, we need at least a little something to eat. Otherwise, there's glow all over the baby, one bone. Carl immediately grimaced. I do not want to eat. If there's porridge, I will not. I do not like porridge. He whimpered. It's not gruel. I ran home and had time to cook mashed potatoes and meatballs. Just try it. How good is it? With tomato. Come on. A spoonful for daddy. And another one. What about me? I tried, didn't I? That's a good boy. And look, how can a robot shoot? Come on, Dad, can you show us? We'll have another spoonful. So with a lot of cajoling and joking, Amelia easily fed the baby, and he didn't even notice how he ate it all. Earl was amazed, watching this fascinating process. He began to praise the girl. Bravo, Amelia. I'm ready to give her a standing ovation. Where did you learn how to so skillfully handle the kids? Feeding my son, that was always a problem. That naughty boy always refused normal food and demanded mountains of candy. Amelia only shrugged her shoulders. I don't know. In the orphanage, sometimes like to take care of the kids, but there, however, persuasion to eat was not necessary. Everything was swallowed up to the last crumb. I'm just really worried about Carl, and I want him to get stronger and stronger as soon as possible. From that day on, Earl and Amelia talked a lot, she visited them and Carl a lot, and on weekends she could take the baby to her house for the day if Earl was busy at work. She and Carl were very easy, they got along wonderfully, and the baby, to her surprise, never once asked about his mother. One day she made up her mind and broached the difficult subject with Earl. Did you tell Inge that your son had been found? She must have been happy, huh? Didn't she want to see her son, hold him, live with him? Excuse me for asking, but it's so strange to me. And Carl has never asked about her. I don't understand. Earl immediately became sad and replied, Yes, you're right. It's not that strange. It's wild. Of course, I called and told Inga the news. What am I? What kind of a beast? A mother, after all. We hadn't seen each other since the divorce. I thought she'd be happy, and she'd come running to her son. But no. Turns out Inga went to Bali with a young boyfriend. She said she was very happy, but said that she was not going to return yet, and that Carl did not fit into her plans for the future. Can you imagine that? Her own son not fitting into his mother's plans. It made my hair stand on end. I told her I was going to have her mother's rights taken away and my son would stay with me. But she wasn't too upset about that either. She just blurted out, do as you please. That's it, Xiao. I have a massage in 10 minutes. And Carl, my son has never felt the return, the warmth, the affection from her. That's why he doesn't remember her. After all, to be honest, he spent three years of his life mostly with me and the nanny, not his own mother. She always had no time for her son. That's the way it is, Amelia. But your son immediately reached out to you. And you, I see. He really liked it. And I am very happy about that. The girl said candidly, You know, I really loved Carl, like a son. Such a wonderful boy. Of course, he is still hard to adapt to a normal life after all the time he was pilled with pills. But I try to read him fairy tales. We are adding cubes and learning letters little by little. I think if you work with him all the time, things will get better. Earl suddenly looked at her in a special way. 
penetrating, and said without taking his eyes off. I like you very much, Amelia. I've never met anyone like you. You are real. May I kiss you? He pulled her to him and kissed her softly. Amelia's eyes were blurry and the ground fell from under her feet. Earl didn't take her home that night. So they moved in together. Surprisingly, the three of them were at once so easy and comfortable as if they had already lived half their lives together. In the meantime, Earl and his father, the well-known businessman Korolev, made such a fuss that the police had to get their act together. The best investigator, Mikhailov, was assigned to investigate the case. He organized raids and raids, pinned to the wall the very bouncers who threatened Amelia, and uncovered a whole criminal scheme. It turned out to be a business of enormous proportions, in which officials and the police were involved. Many beggars were sleeping and living in the filthy garage, right on bare mattresses. These were either invalids or women with children who had been stolen, who were more likely to be served. They were mercilessly exploited, taking all their money. The poor people worked literally for a piece of bread. And that was it. At the same time, it was simply impossible to escape or escape, and such desperados were beaten to death. What was there to be afraid of? They were homeless. No one would miss them or look for them. As a result, a lot of the heads who were sitting in the warm seats controlling this bloody black business got blown off. They didn't even care about the children, whether they died or survived. The main thing was that the child should sleep quietly and not interfere with work. But now all the perpetrators got what they deserved. Earl had personally made sure of that. Earl was determined, so as soon as he and his bride started living together, the first weekend he informed her, Pack it up, Amelia. Let's go to my parents. We will get acquainted. The program includes grilled salmon, oysters, and many other delicacies. My mom's a real show-off, so don't be surprised. The girl was really scared. Earl, why don't we just skip it? I don't like these things. And that scar, I'm so embarrassed. God forbid they make fun of me. They'll say you've got yourself a poor woman. And I can't even eat oysters. I'm afraid somehow. But the man took her in his arms, kissed her, and began to reassure her. Why are you getting yourself worked up in advance? Everything will be fine. You'll see. Well, you have to meet your mother-in-law. Mind you, I'm going to marry you. You're mine alone, and I don't want another one. No matter how beautiful she is a hundred times. So I won't take any objections. Run and get ready. We've got to get Sasha dressed. And that's the test of strength. Amelia was very excited. She put on her best chiffon dress with an elegant belt, let her hair down and tried to cover the hateful scar with long bangs. The image was completed with beautiful emerald earrings. They were so matched to her green eyes and as she thought, slightly diverted attention from the injury. Earl whistled when he saw her. He started complimenting her. Wow, you look even prettier now. That dress looks great on you. Well, son, how beautiful is our Amelia? Carl lifted his thumb up and showed his class. Amelia calmed down a little, and they went to Earl's parents. They hugged and kissed Earl and their grandson with great joy. But Amelia was greeted with obvious coolness. The man hugged her right away though, and introduced her to her parents. Mom, Dad, this is my fiancée Amelia. It was she who saved our Carl from these terrible people. She literally worked a miracle. And I met my son again. I ask for your love and respect. The father, Kyle, shook her hand and said, It's a pleasure. Thank you so much for saving your grandson. That's very noble of you. The mother, Eva, merely pursed her lips and said hello. Amelia immediately felt uncomfortable from the first minutes she had been in the house. Everyone went into the living room. There was a sumptuous table and beside each plate was a pile of cutlery, half of which Amelia had never even seen before. Everyone was seated, and the dinner party began. More like torture. Earl's parents were all focused on her. The only questions that came out were, Who are your parents? What school did you go to? Where do you work? Where do you live? What education? Where have you been abroad? 
what was your favorite country, and so on. When Amelia honestly answered that she was an orphan and was brought up in an orphanage, an unpleasant grimace immediately distorted Kyle's face and the fact that she lived in a regular dorm room and it all threw the groom's parents into shock. Eva teased her subtly, Amelia, passed the lobster tongs. No, they are not. Why don't you eat almost anything? Or don't you like our treats? I don't think they serve such delicacies in your dorm. Amelia was blushing and ready to fall to the ground. She wanted to get up and run away from here. But Earl was sitting beside her, giving her a reassuring look, trying to make jokes, trying to change the subject, but not very well, to be honest. Things were getting more and more heated. Suddenly Carl, who at the time was exploring the huge remote-controlled car his grandfather had given him, got off it unsuccessfully and fell to the floor and cried heavily. Earl jerked to run to his son, but Amelia beat him to it and instinctively rushed to the baby to comfort him. On the way, she pushed the chair awkwardly back and it fell with a bang. Eva grinned, whack manners, like an elephant in a china shop. Earl, while your Amelia is gone, let's talk. Are you out of your mind? You got one better than the other. The first one was a frumpy little chicken with no brains, and now you got an orphan with a handicap. What do you need her for? Earl was very indignant. How could you do this? I love Amelia, and she loves me. And Carl loves her. If it wasn't for her, my son wouldn't even be alive. You're crazy to say such terrible things. And then the father joined in the conversation. Earl, think about it. She's from an orphanage. Do you know what kind of kids go there? I bet she comes from a broken home. And that scar, where did she get it? She probably got it from her alcoholic parents too, right? Why do you need such a bride? We've already got an ambassador's daughter for you. Why don't you stop messing around with the marginalized and think about our family's reputation? In the heat of the argument, no one noticed that Amelia stood behind them and heard everything. Her tears were choking her and her anger was bubbling up inside. She began frantically rummaging through her purse and pulling out her father's order of courage. She threw it right in Kyle's face with the words, how dare you judge a man without knowing anything about him? Who gave you the right? My parents aren't alcoholics at all. My dad saved 15 people in an accident when the bus flipped over and had caught on fire. And he died like a hero. They gave him a posthumous medal. And they sent me to an orphanage. I was only seven years old at the time. I got that scar on my face from there. It burned me. Do you know what it's like to live in an orphanage after a family and a home? You didn't like me. Then I'll leave. But I won't stand for this kind of humiliation. You can't measure everything in life by money. There are still feelings, but you probably do not understand it. She turned around and was about to leave, holding back her sobs when suddenly Kyle called her. Amelia, wait, wait. Your last name is Rose, isn't it? Wasn't your father's name Thomas? That's right. But what do you care? It can't be. Oh my God. He's the one who got Eva and Earl off that bus. They were going to the sea that day too. I took them there myself. Your father broke the glass with his feet, put his jacket on Earl, and pulled him out to avoid being cut by shrapnel, and then came back for Eva. I still admire his courage and bravery, and I owe him a debt of gratitude as I too could have lost my wife and son forever. The man suddenly got down on his knees and began to beg. Forgive us, girl. Forgive us for everything. We are eternally in your father's debt. And I heard that the hero died and was awarded posthumously. But I didn't know if he had children or relatives. Now I am indebted to you too. That's who you are so brave and determined, kind and sympathetic. Don't go away. I beg you. I'll make it up to you, I promise. Eva's eyes moistened. Apparently the very memories came back. She went over to the girl and hugged her warmly. Excuse me, Amelia, it was me. I started a scandal. I got everybody all worked up. I hurt you for nothing. To hell with the ambassador's daughter. I promise I'll be a better mother-in-law 
and no more mockery. Well, peace. Amelia, too, burst into tears from too much emotion and nodded her head. Peace. I really love Earl and Carl, and I can't imagine my life without them. And I'm happy to have them in my life. It's my meaning now, my motivation. Do you think I like walking around like a freak? Yes, ever since I was a child. I hate this damn scar. But how many times I have not applied to the hospital. The doctors only shrug their shoulders, saying that it's too big and deep. There's nothing you can do about it. They are afraid of hitting the facial nerve. Then they said, it might paralyze her face. Kyle cheered her up. I can't promise anything yet, but I'll try to help. I have a friend in the northern capital, a master of his craft, a plastic surgeon from God. Let's go to him for a consultation. Maybe he'll come up with something. The rest of the evening passed remarkably well. Eva with laughter and jokes taught Amelia to eat these lobsters and oysters. She laughed and recalled incidents from her life. The first time I was given an oyster to try at a dinner party, I was horrified. A mouthful, eyes rolled out, a rare disgust. I feel sick and spit out uncomfortable. I barely made it to the bathroom. It wasn't until much later that I learned how to cook and eat them right. Earl laughed and hugged his bride and added, and I can't stand them at all. They're so slippery and disgusting. As for me, the roast that Amelia cooks in the oven, a hundred times better. She's such a good girl. And the way she can talk Sashka, it's just a talent. He now eats like a soldier, all that is put on the plate. The girl flushed and pressed closer to Earl. She was overjoyed by his kind words and more importantly, by his support. For he, like a lion, had rushed to defend her from her parents' attacks and stood by her side, even in spite of them. And that was worth a lot. They returned home late at night. Carl fell asleep in Amelia's arms in the car, sniffling so sweetly as he hugged her, keeping her warm, and everything inside was singing with love for this little and so defenseless little man. A week later, Kyle kept his word, got all the doctors on their feet, and brought Amelia for a consultation with a plastic surgeon. Yuri Ivanovich was a true virtuoso in his field. He was approached by the most famous stars and public figures in the pursuit of beauty. Amelia went without much hope for a miracle because she had already been told many times that it was impossible to correct the defect. But the doctor examined her for a surprisingly long and picky time and rendered his verdict. What can I say? The burn is very deep, of course, but the situation can be improved. It would not be cheap and would require several operations, most likely three, maybe four. And that's anesthesia, pain, and a long healing time. Would you be willing to do all that? Kyle hustled. Don't worry about paying for it. I'll take care of it. Well, what about you, Amelia? Would you make that kind of sacrifice? It's not a month we'll have to travel to clinics with bandages on his face. Or would you say no? Earl loves you, and so do we. The girl was quiet, weighed everything up, and then said, I can take it all. I promise I won't cry once. I've been dreaming ever since I was a little girl to get rid of that ugly scar. I have endured so much mockery, so much ridicule because of it, not to count. So I agree. I can't even believe I can get rid of it, but it was easier said than done. Amelia had no idea when she agreed to it. What a hell of a pain it was when the anesthesia wore off, how uncomfortable it was to walk with a bandaged face, to endure painful injections and bandages. I had to quit my job. When, after the first and most difficult surgery, it was time to remove the bandages, she was just shaking. She was panicked afraid to look in the mirror and kept asking the nurse, well, how is it? Is it a little better or worse? I'm so scared. What if my face is even more twisted? She reassured her, smiled, and handed her the mirror. Amelia's joy was overflowing when she saw that the scar had shrunk and smoothed out and the skin was no longer tightening. With each surgery, the girl's face transformed, and after the third, final one, she was just a beauty. Earl watched and admired, 
He was terribly proud of his bride, supported her in everything, helped her through the pain and fear. Meanwhile, Amelia had graduated from university by correspondence, but her degree was never useful to her. Her fiancé realized her long-cherished dream and got her a job at the swimming school as an instructor. The girl was just happy because it was her true calling. She enjoyed swimming and teaching others to swim. All the more so because Amelia was good at finding an approach to children, and they loved her wholeheartedly. In addition, her work took only a few hours a day, and the rest of the time she spent with Carl. She took a great pleasure in his care. And of course, she did not forget about Earl. Their nights were still unforgettable. Six months later, the couple decided to have a big wedding. Amelia was reluctant at first. She didn't like publicity, but Eva talked her into it. Amelia, a wedding is such a momentous occasion. It should be at least once in every girl's life. No matter what happens next, it's a wedding that comes to mind as the most touching moment. And then I want everyone around me to be jealous of what a beautiful woman my son will marry. One can only dream of a daughter-in-law like you. On the day of the celebration, Amelia was simply radiant. She looked at herself in the mirror and couldn't believe her eyes. Gorgeous hair, a delicate white dress, a tiara, and no scar. Only soft, supple skin. It seemed all her dreams had come true at once. There were lots of guests, photographers, and press at the swanky restaurant. What a joke! The son of Korolev himself is getting married for the second time. And the bride, just a looker. You can't take your eyes off her. In the midst of the celebration, Carl took a microphone in his hands and decided to congratulate his parents too. The boy, trying not to use his foul language, said loudly and seriously, Mum Amelia, congratulations, I wish you happiness with Daddy. Together you live in a family. Quickly give birth to a brother. From such a touching poem, and the fact that Carl himself called her mom, Amelia could not stand it and cried. She jumped up to the baby, took him in her arms, hugged him and said, Thank you, my darling. My son, I love you so much and will not give anyone. The guests applauded for a long time, and many in the hall also cried, watching this touching picture. Amelia had no idea that the surprise was almost ruined. Guards just in time noticed that the drunken Inga was trying to sneak through the kitchen. After hearing on the phone from friends that her ex was getting married again to a young beauty, she somehow became furious. Immediately, she remembered her son and decided to take him away. To be brave and uninhibited, she decided to drink some cognac, but she overdid it, so the spectacle was not for the faint of heart. Inga rushed into the hall, could barely stand on her feet, makeup on her face smeared, and the heel of an expensive shoe broke when she fought with a guard. The woman shouted, Why, you bastard, you want to get married? Did you find a young woman? And that son is mine, not hers. I'm the mother, and I'll take him, you know I will. Earl came running into the noise, seeing his ex-girlfriend looking so ugly, it made him shudder. After her tirade, he angrily said, Zakhar, take this woman to the hotel and make sure that she does not cause us any more trouble. I never want to see her again. Then he grabbed her by the scruff of her coat, shook her and said harshly, what kind of mother are you? You're a cuckoo, and besides, you're a whore. Get out of my life. I took away your maternal rights, and you have no right to see Carl. And if you pester me, I'll make you pay alimony until your son is 18. Get out. The guard took her firmly under the arms and dragged her to the car. She was hysterical for a long time, drinking cognac straight from her throat and behaving disgustingly and then she just collapsed onto the bed and fell asleep, just like she was, in her coat. In the morning, she was awakened by a persistent knock on the door. The woman could hardly tear her head away from the pillow. It was humming like a bell, her mouth was dry, and her whole body was aching. She waddled reluctantly to open the door. On the threshold stood Kyle, looking menacing. He looked squeamishly at the not yet fully sober woman, 
put some papers on the bedside table, then said in an icy voice, So, my dear, here is a plane ticket and a lot of money. Your flight leaves in an hour. Get ready and hurry up. Why did you come here? Your son divorced a long time ago. You never loved him. And you know it. You're not a good wife. You're an even worse mother. You've never looked after Carl. All you had in mind was to go out with young lovers. Why do you want to see Carl? What will you tell him? The boys just found a real loving family. Amelia loves him sincerely, and he's calling her, you know, her, not you, his mother. So let's say you take him away, and what? You will not be able to devote all your time to him. You will quickly play at being a mother's daughter. And then what? The boy will suffer again. No way. You had a family, but you gave it up for fun. I will not let you ruin my son's life again. I'm warning you, if you ever set foot in this town again, you're on your own head. I'll make your life a living hell, you know me. Cab is downstairs. There's a guard at the door. Time is running out. Get ready. The woman wrapped her arms around her head and shouted in anger. But I gave birth to Carl, which means I'm a mother. Kyle shook his head. You're wrong. A mother isn't the one who gave birth. She's the one who loves her child, puts her heart and soul into it, and devotes her life to it. Remember that. A goodbye, and the man left, honking his step like in the army. And Inga fell back on her pillow and roared with helplessness and anger. She was angry. Damn, he is right about everything. Why, stupid, I did not live quietly. And now what? It's thirty and I'm alone. So tired of these resorts and young boys replacing each other. All this, it turns out, is such a tinsel, and there is no happiness, just a splash. And Earl and Amelia began a quiet and peaceful family life, without passion or scandal, but with warmth and care for each other. They often went to the amusement park together on weekends, and they had a lot of fun with Carl. They ate enormous cotton candy and rode merry-go-rounds, just like when they were kids, and they were perfectly happy. One day, the newlyweds decided to order pizza at home and decided to watch an interesting comedy and not go anywhere. The doorbell rang. Amelia called out. It's the delivery guy. I guess I'll get it, honey. On the threshold of the posh apartment stood Valera. His appearance was, to put it bluntly, not very fresh. His cap pulled down over his eyes. When he saw the blooming Amelia, so beautiful, in an expensive silk gown, and without a single flaw on his face, just lost the power of speech, and began to mumble. Good afternoon, did you order delivery? Wow, Amelia, is that you? How great you look. Do you live here? Are you married? Reza dumped me, you know, she played with me and dumped me. The viper. She threw me out on the street without a penny like a mangy puppy. Now he's working as a courier again. Can we meet like we used to? Earl went out to see what was taking Amelia so long and asked in surprise, Lovely, well, where are you stuck there? What's taking so long? Is everything all right? Amelia kissed him on the cheek and replied, Yes, honey, everything is all right. The courier was sluggish. He almost mixed up the order. She took the order, signed the sheet, and slammed the door right in front of Valera. And he stood there with his mouth open, biting his elbows that he lost such a beautiful and clever girl in pursuit of a long rouble. And in the end, he was left as the old woman, from the tale of the fisherman, and the fish at the bottom of the barrel.